In John chapter 15, verse 14, Jesus said, You are my friend if you do whatsoever I command you. Now, that principle separates the lukewarm members from the faithful. That principle separates true churches of Christ from denomination and from wayward congregations of the Lord's people. And in Hebrews 10, 25, we see the warning not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And I really appreciated that point that he made in the last hour. Are we lukewarm? If not, then why are we not here when we need to be? Now that principle separates uh, a man that I knew in the church one time in a place where I preached. He drove a big fancy car, and he would attend services about once every month or two, and his wife would come a little more, not every Sunday. And a lot of times when he wouldn't be there, she would make excuses for him. You know, he was a crane operator. He was making big money overtime. She said, well, he's working today. He's never turned them down. He's never turned them down. And I thought, well, you sure have turned the Lord down many times. And whenever he would come, I would bear down on forsaking the assembly. And who would come out the door and tell me, preacher, what a great sermon that was? <laughs> that same brother. You know, friends, that separates him from a lady that shortly after we started Central Congregation back in 2011, this lady was an older lady. She was restored to the Lord after we started that congregation. She didn't have much. She had an artificial egg. Uh, one Lord's Day evening, we took her home after worship. And the next day, we received the word that her daughter found her that day sitting at the kitchen table with her church clothes on where she was sitting after she came home after worship. Now, she strove to be there. She had very poor health, but she strove to be there as much as she could. And what a joy it was not to see her pass away, but the fact that she died in the Lord. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord, Revelation 14, 13. This principle will separate her from that man making that big money and forsaking the assembly of the saints. For Jesus said, Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever, I command you. It's the whatsoever that gets many people. You know, we have some congregations, they do some things that are right, and I'm talking about those claiming to be churches of Christ, but there are some things they won't do. They won't do what God commands and mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them, Romans 16, 17. They will not do what we are commanded to do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is by his authority, to withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not according to the tradition which he received of us, 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6. You know, some of these congregations won't teach any overt error but yet they will not bear down and make applications of the Lord's teaching on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Matthew 19, 9, where Jesus said, I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. Now this principle separates congregations like this one here at Spring and those congregations who refuse to do Whatsoever the Lord says, all things that he has commanded us. Those who follow this principle are separated and set apart from half-hearted members of the church. It separates one such as Antimus, who was my faithful martyr, Jesus said in Revelation 2.13, from those lukewarm Laodiceans. To whom the Lord said, So then because I were neither cold nor hot, because I were lukewarm, I will spew thee out of my mouth. This is true Christ likeness to do whatsoever God commands us to do. 
And it is the only way that we can continue in the love of God. If you turn to John 15th chapter, you will see this. In verses 9 and 10, Jesus said, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Well, how, Lord, how can we continue in thy love? Verse number 10, If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. Look at the whatsoever for the Lord. He was willing to do whatsoever the Father would have him to do. He prayed in the garden the night before his crucifixion, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Matthew 26, 39. And we read in Philippians 2 and verse number 8, that being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He not only died for man, but he died the death of the cross. The most humiliating, excruciating, and agonizing form of execution known to man. Even the death of the cross. Those, that's a powerful phrase there. It indicates that whatsoever that Jesus was willing to do that was the Father's will. He also said in John 8, 29, He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please Him. Now there's again that principle. To do whatsoever the will of God is. I do always those things that please Him. But again, going back to the words of Jesus, we can only continue in His love if we love him and keep his commandments. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, verse 15. Jude said, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Jude in verse 21. But the only way that we can do that is to do as the Lord said here, to do whatsoever I command you. Now let's analyze this verse here for a few minutes. Jesus said, ye are my friends. Ye, that's very personal. That applies to all. Before the close of the Bible, and the Spirit and the bride say, come, and let him that heareth say, come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Whosoever will may do whatsoever the Lord says. It's for all of us. The application is for all. As Jesus said to them all in Luke 9, 23, Ye are my friends. He said, rather than he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. He said, Ye are my friends. What does it mean to be a friend of the Lord? There was a man that we read about in Luke 18 and Mark 10 and also in Matthew chapter 19. We commonly call him the rich young ruler. But we see why this man could not be a friend of Jesus. He could not be a friend of the Lord unless and until he repented and changed the kind of heart that he had. Yes, he came running to the Lord and kneeling before him and asking, What good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? And the Lord told him to keep the commandments. He said, These have I kept from my youth up. What well, like I yet? And the Lord told him to go, sell all that he had, and give to the poor, and come and follow me. But Matthew 19, 22 states that the young man went away sorrowful at that saying, for he had great possessions. Now here was a man who was willing to do some things for the Lord, but there was something standing between him and God. It doesn't have to be ten things or a thousand things, but only one thing can keep us from being a friend of Jesus Christ. And it was his love of his riches and material things that he was unwilling to give up. This young man refused to be a friend to Jesus. Will we be a friend to Jesus, like the song says, and as the Lord bids us to do? We read in the Bible about a man, though, who was a friend of God. Way back there in the patriarchal age, he was willing to do what many now living today in this age of greater light are unwilling to do. He was willing to take his son, his only son, up upon a mountain and offer him in burnt offering according to Genesis chapter 22. And right before he followed through with that, the Lord stayed him from doing it. And we read about it also in Hebrews 11 
7 to 19, and also in James 2, 21 to 23. And I'd like to read James' account here, beginning at verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Since thou have faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Abraham was the friend of God because he was willing to do whatsoever God commanded him, even to the point of taking his son Isaac upon, upon the mountain and offering him in sacrifice. We also learn here, friends, what true biblical belief is. It necessarily entails obedience. It's not faith only or mental assent. But then we have another word in this verse, it's a mighty big word. Jesus said, you are my friends if. If is a mighty big word. Small in spelling, but major in importance. The word, of course, if, refutes Calvinism. You remember that movie from back in the 50s, The Man Who Knew Too Much with Doris Day and James Stewart? And she sang that song, Que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. That's the Calvinist. But the word if teaches us that's not true. Jesus said, you are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Man does play a part in his destiny and destination. Jesus said, if ye love me, keep my commandments. In John 13, 17, he said, if ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Now why is it we have so many members of the church that aren't really joyful and happy? Because they have not learned that humble servitude, the pattern of which the Lord set before us. They have not learned the greatness of humility and service. That the one who humbles himself will be exalted, but the one who exalts himself will be brought down or abased. And that by the hand of God, Matthew 23, 11 and 12, James 4, 6 to 10, 1 Peter 5 and 6, and Proverbs 16, 18. He that is greatest among you shall be your servant. The Lord had just finished washing the disciples' feet. But those who haven't learned the principle of humble servitude and doing whatsoever the Lord says out of love and humility, they don't have the true joy of the Lord. We note also the word if is a mighty big word when it comes to salvation. When Philip was preaching to the Ethiopian eunuch on the wilderness road to Gaza in Acts chapter 8, they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord called away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Indeed, if is a very important word. He said, you are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Now, there's another big word in the Bible, D-O-Do. Yes, it's small in spelling, but it's big in importance. It will destroy the entire denominational world. It will destroy all the false doctrine. For example, it will destroy the doctrine of faith only. James said, even so, faith that hath not works is dead, being alone, James 2, verse 17. We know that without doing the will of God, we cannot enter into heaven. Jesus said, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, Matthew 7 and verse number 21. James said, but be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves, James 1, 22. And he that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he that is Christ is righteous. 1 John 3 and verse number 7. It's interesting on Pentecost Day that when the Jews on Pentecost heard the gospel, they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Acts 2 verse 37. And then Peter said unto them, don't use that word do, just say by faith alone. <laughs> no, he didn't do that. That's false. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Then we come to the Philippian jailer after midnight in Acts 16. He said, Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? 
Did Paul and Silas correct him and say, Oh, no, you don't have to do anything. You're saved by faith only. No, they commanded him to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And they preached unto him the word of the Lord. Then he came to faith and he was baptized because belief involves obedience. He and his household were baptized in that same hour. We read in verses 31 to 34 in that context. But then the Lord said, You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. It is amazing in the book of Deuteronomy, the words of the Lord through Moses and their likeness to the words of Jesus in Matthew 28, 20. In Deuteronomy chapter 11 and verse 32, And ye shall observe to do all the statutes and judgments which I set before you this day. And then at the end of chapter 12 of Deuteronomy in verse 32, what thing soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. Another way of saying, do all and whatsoever the Lord commands us to do. We remember when Jesus gave the great commission. He said, all power and authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. But Jesus said, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Indeed, the Lord has the authority to command us what to do. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Matthew 16, 16. He is the everlasting God and the King eternal, 1 Timothy 1, verse 17. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and the blessed and only potentate, 1 Timothy 6, and verse 15. When Saul was persecuting the church, the Lord appeared to him on the road to Damascus. And we remember what Saul asked him there before he went into the city. He, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Saul was trembling and astonished. And Isaiah 66 and verse 2, But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite heart or spirit, and trembleth at my word. There is no doubt but what Saul recognized Jesus Christ as the true Lord when he trembled in his time and said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? But then Jesus said, whatsoever I command you. Now I want to spend just a few moments on this because this is at the very root of many of the problems that we're having today in the church. In Jude, in verse number 8, Jude said, Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. The word command has a ring of authority to it. It indicates that the Lord has authority over us. Now this is what many people today despise, what they literally hate. It is dominion or authority. They do not even want the Lord to have authority over them. They do not respect the authority of the Scriptures. They are like those described by Paul in Romans 3.18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. You know, this is the root problem in our country today and even in the church. People don't fear God. They don't respect God. And also in 2 Peter chapter 2, in verse number 10, we have a like passage. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. That is, they despise authority. Presumptuous are they self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Now, why are they presumptuous? Why are they self-willed? Why are they not afraid to speak evil of dignities? Because they despise authority. Jesus said, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Now, last of all this morning, friends, I'd like to make a few applications before we close in a few minutes. I read the story about a mother who got up in the middle of the night, in the dark of the night, to give her children medicine, and she did. 
And when morning light came, the children were all dead. She had given them poison instead of medicine. If she had only taken the time to get a light and to see what she was giving them. Now what about the souls of people? Why do people not take the time to do as we have done Friday night, Saturday, and today and search the scriptures? Why are people not willing to be that worthy workman in the word of God? And I'm not just talking about people outside the church. I'm talking about people in the Lord's church. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. My friend, for the sake of your own soul and that of your precious family, you need to be a worker in the Word of God and search the Scriptures daily. You need to be a student of God's Word. So let's be a student now and make some applications. Let's look at the Lord's address briefly to the church at Thyatira. In Revelation 2, verse 20 and 21, after commending the church at Thyatira for some things in verse 19, Jesus said, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Now that's strong for the Lord to have something against you. The Lord had something against them. Because thou sufferest, that is, you are permitting that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. She was given the time and opportunity to repent, but she refused. She is called, and I believe figuratively, by the name of Jezebel. We read of Jezebel in 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 25, the wife of King Ahab in Israel. But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. And maybe that's one reason this woman was given this appellation of Jezebel in the church of Thyatira. She knew how to stir people up and to seduce them to commit fornication and other things that were against the will of the Lord. You know, we need to stir up one another in the church. We need to provoke one another unto love and to good works. Hebrews 10, verse 24. Yes, we need to stir up one another in the family to do what's right, to do God's will, but not to do wickedness and not to do evil. Why did the Lord have this against them? Because they were failing to deal with sin in the body of Christ, and thus they were sinning themselves. Like the Corinthians who were tolerating an incestuous, fornicating brother in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And they, he commanded them to withdraw from this man, to deal with him. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're come together. There in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 3 to 5. And they repented. They actually needed to repent themselves, not just the brother in fornication. But we read how the Corinthians themselves repented of their inaction there in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And also how this brother in fornication repented after they dealt with his soul according to the Lord's authority. He did repent. For God is our work of repentance unto salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 10. Now today, we have preachers who are not preaching whatsoever the Lord has commanded. They are not preaching whatsoever the Lord says. Now let's think about this today. The whatsoever the Lord commands is not just in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In John chapter 16, Jesus told his apostles, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. Verses 12 to 15. The things that the Spirit revealed to the apostles, which the Lord had not revealed to them while he was on earth, were the things of Jesus Christ. 
So everything between Matthew and Revelation is what the Lord has commanded and what the Lord teaches. And we have many today who are not willing to do that. Maybe you heard the story about the preacher in Kentucky who uh, started preaching against tobacco. And one of the brethren came to him. They said, now, brother, don't you know that we got a lot of people growing tobacco in Kentucky? You don't need to preach against that. So he got up again. He started preaching on gambling. Same brother came around to him. He said, now, now brother, don't you know that we got the Kentucky Derby up here in, in Louisville? And you don't need to be preaching against gambling. So he got up and preached against liquor. Same brother came around. He said, don't you know we got liquor distillers in Kentucky? You don't need to preach against that. And he finally said, well, what shall I preach on? He said, well, why don't you preach on witch doctors? We don't have one of them within a thousand miles of here. And you know, friend, that's the way some of our brethren reason. You can preach against sin. You can preach on things. Just don't preach on anything here. Don't preach on anything that's up close and personal. One of the older gospel preachers said that there are going to be many preachers lost because of what they did not preach. And I believe he's right about that. We may preach many, many things that are right and never preach any overt error, but refuse to preach the whole counsel of God. Paul did not shrink back or shun from declaring the whole counsel of God. And because of that, he was free from the blood of all men. Their souls would not be on his head because he didn't hold back. Now what does that imply? That if we do hold back, that when we reach the judgment, the blood of some is going to be on our head. That's very strong, isn't it? The Lord said, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Now the tired tyrants needed to repent of their falling short of the glory of God. We know that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. That is, to come short of God's glory. It means deficient in regard to or lacking in or failing to do God's will. That's what it means to fall short of God's glory. That like King Belshazzar back there in the book of Daniel when he saw the handwriting on the wall, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Eupharson, one of those messages was, Thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting, but you are morally, spiritually deficient. James said, To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. We've been talking about fellowship this weekend. How does that relate to whatsoever the Lord commands us? Well, it relates a lot. Because there are some who are willing to oppose error or withdraw fellowship as long as it's not too close to me personally or somebody in my family or a close friend or a long-time preacher or elder that I've loved and respected in the past but is now gone by the way. And we do have those in the brotherhood today. Or a congregation that I have loved dearly, that I've been close to. There are many who are not willing to do the whatsoever in that case. I'd like to go back to the book of Deuteronomy before we close. And I hope you'll turn back there with me. Deuteronomy chapter 13, this was in the law of Moses. We're not under the law of Moses today. And certainly we're, God is not commanding us to put anyone physically to death today in the church. No, that's not the point. The point is they were issued a difficult command, challenge, and charge, and they were to carry it out. It did not matter whosoever or whatsoever. They were to do it. Beginning at verse number 6. If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul, entice thee secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, 
which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers, namely of the gods of the people which are round about you, nigh unto thee, or far off from thee, from the one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth, Thou shalt not consent unto him, nor hearken unto him, neither shalt thine eye pity him, neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal him, but thou shalt surely kill him. Thine hand shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterwards the hand of all the people. And thou shalt stone him with stones, that he die. Because he hath sought to thrust thee away from the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Now, what are people doing who bring sin into the church and who bring error into the church and in the brotherhood? They are seeking to lead the children of God away from Jehovah God, the true and living God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because just as the theme of our lectureship is involved in this one verse and many others, whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Now Paul said that, he said that, or Jesus said, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. In Matthew chapter 10. Can we make this application when it comes to fellowship? To people in our own family? People that we have known in the love in the church? We are to still mark them and withdraw if they cease to abide in the doctrine of Jesus Christ. But there are very, very few congregations and brethren who are willing to to do what the Lord said. To do whatsoever I command you. Do we have here this morning those who have not done whatsoever the Lord has commanded? Maybe you have not committed immorality. Maybe you have not brought false doctrine. Maybe the problem in your life is what James said to him that knoweth to do it good and doeth it not to him in sin. James 4.17 and how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Hebrews 2, 3. And that you have not done all that the Lord has commanded. You've not been faithful to observe all things whatsoever Jesus Christ has commanded us. And this morning as a member of the church, you need to repent and pray God's forgiveness. According to Acts 8, verse 22, that you might be forgiven as a member of the body of Christ. Or maybe we have someone here who's never obeyed the gospel. Why not be like that Ethiopian eunuch and go on your way rejoicing today? Here was a man who was begging to be baptized. That man was earnest and sincere. That man was of a humble, poor, and contrite spirit who trembled at the word of the Lord. Are you that kind of person today? You've heard the word of God. Do you believe it with all of your heart? Romans 10, 17. Are you willing to repent? Acts 2, 38. To make the confession that he did, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Acts 8, 37. Then do not tarry, do not delay, but arise and be baptized. And wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord, that the blood of Christ might wash your sins away. And that you might put on Christ, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Would you come and do that today while we stand and we sing?